Hello my friends and welcome to Panzercore 2 Heroes and Abilities tier list. This is like my most requested guide since forever. Uh, special thanks to Tassadar from the Slytherin forums for helping me get all the images together for all the heroes and all the abilities so that we can rate them. Now, <clears throat> I will be rating every ability and hero in the game. And the game has special heroes that have lots of abilities. I mean, those ones are always pretty much, they're pretty much always exceptional, so you can just dump all those straight into S. Um, here we're going to have a look at the individual abilities, i.e. the normal heroes and normal abilities. This is going to be a long video, because we are doing them all, and um, hopefully I can give you guys some insight along the way into certain details of certain abilities. Okay, so let's begin. AA support. Now, if a mod ever... Uh, if a mod ever introduced this hero, because it's normally just a, the ability of anti-aircraft guns, if a mod introduced this as a hero, uh, it would be useless, because only anti-aircraft guns have got anti-air attack values. So, the only thing you could theoretically use this on that would not be an anti-aircraft gun would be a ship, because ships do have anti-aircraft values. So in theory, this would work on a ship. So that might be important in the future. But for the most part, this is an ability that only comes with anti-aircraft guns. Perfectly normal ability that uh, allows anti-aircraft guns to attack uh, aircraft that are attacking nearby units. Okay, aggressive counter-attack. This is actually a much better hero than people give it credit for. Um, it's true power lies in, uh, on infantry in city tiles, and I will explain why. So, those of you who have seen the Rule of Ten guide will know that having plus or minus ten from whatever someone's defense value is, um, is the difference, it's like 10% per point roughly, um, kill value. So, if your attack and defense value is close to the enemy's ground defense value, plus three is a 30% bonus, which is pretty serious bonus when defending. Now, if you actually look at... Here's one I prepared earlier. If you actually look at a lot of infantry, they have... Um, hard attack values of around 11, 13, um, in the early war it'll be around 7, 11, 13-ish. And if you look at some of the more serious tanks, noting their close defense values, you're looking at about 3 or 4 points of close defense value. Some uh, tanks that are particularly adept at killing infantry, for example, the Flame Panzer has a close defense value of 7. So, and obviously infantry on infantry. Uh, infantry has got defense values of around 8 most of the time, and in close defense of 3 to 8, I think it might be as high as 9 for late, late game pioneers, no, 8. So all of these values are very tightly balled together, which means that plus 3 is going to matter. Um, it's gonna, it's, you're gonna get the full value for it, it won't be wasted. So, if you were gonna do 10 damage, you would do 13. If you were gonna do 5 damage, you would do 6.5, and so on, on the, on the counter-attack. Combined with readiness, it's a very, very powerful ability, because, um, infantry in a close combat tile with aggressive counter-attack and readiness is gonna devastate pretty much anything that attacks it. So, it's a, it's an ability that is much more powerful than people give it credit for, but it's not game-changing or anything like that. S, I'm going S-tier is going to be my game-changing stuff. Um, but yeah, it's a solid hero. It's better than people give it credit for. Combine it with readiness. 
and it becomes very, very threatening. Okay, it doesn't help you take territory, but it is one of the best defensive heroes. Aim assistance. I find this difficult to use. So, it gives you 10% accuracy. It gives 10% accuracy to all the units nearest you. The best that that can possibly do is um, provide you with one extra kill. That's the best it can do. Um... Now, what's interesting is, accuracy is determined by EXP and nothing else. It, you, all your units start with 50% uh, accuracy, and when you get to 5 stars, they'll have 100% accuracy. So, in a normal game, this eventually doesn't do anything, because if your units become 5 star, then extra accuracy doesn't help you at all. Once you're at 100, that's it. Now, if you're playing on the hardest difficulty, on Generalismus, then it matters because on Generalismus, you have a... The enemy has a 20% accuracy bonus, and I believe you have a 10% accuracy penalty, I think, which this would offset. But it's tricky to use. Um, if you stick it on a plane, on like a recon plane, um, it works from there. Or on a recon car is also quite useful. Um, early on in the war it's quite useful, but as, as you progress through the game and your units gain more and more experience, this becomes less and less valuable. There's also a minor benefit to it, which is that any attacks made that trigger the ability give experience to... Um, they give experience to the unit that's carrying the hero, so you can actually potentially speed the leveling of a unit by equipping this. All terrain entrenchment, this is unused. This is an unused ability. You might see it in mods, but it wouldn't make a lot of sense. Um, just apparently the, this was supposed to allow you to entrench anywhere, but uh, the way the game works now, you can entrench anywhere. It's uh, so it doesn't, it, it effectively doesn't do anything. Okay, Alpine. This is a really good trait. But I don't think you could ever get it on a hero, but you might see it on a hero in mods. Um, it's the unique ability of the Mountaineers. Uh, plus five and plus plus five attack and plus five defense is huge, and there's already an attack and defense bonus for hills, so it makes Alpine troops exceptionally deadly in their terrain. Um, the biggest issue with it, obviously, is the, the terrain allows its use. You have to be on a map where there's mountains and hills available to really take advantage of it. But, you can always see the map. So, obviously, if the map is full of hills and, and mountains, then you deploy Alpine troops. It's a great ability. And if the map is completely flat, you just don't use that hero. You just use another hero. So, with the correct on the correct map, this is an extremely powerful ability. Um, on the wrong map, obviously it's completely useless, but there's no reason for you to deploy it, to deploy units with Alpine on, on the wrong map. So, you know, I'm just going to presume that you're not, that you haven't lost the plot. And I would say as well that Alpine troops, generally speaking, I think... They don't have the most fantastic stats up front. I don't think that they... Uh, hang on. Yeah, they, 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 they have two less infantry attack and two less close defense than standard regulars. But, um... Obviously, if you shove plus five on there, they easily become the best infantry in the game. Plus, of course, you get the hill bonuses on top. So, in the correct terrain, Alpine is actually an incredibly powerful ability. Once again, something that combines very nicely with um, readiness, if you can ever get it. 
I mean, this this is plus five defense is huge. Can't understate how huge five defense is. Most units in the game. In fact, I'll just I'll make a point of this as well because I really wanna I really want to understand how important that defense value is. So if you look at the ground defense of this, it's ten. Okay, and most offensive tanks have got precisely twenty infantry attack. Oh, in this case, 22. 20, 20, 22, 20, 20, 20, 22, 22, 20, 20. So what that means is, 20 is 10 above 10, obviously. Which means that they're going to get 100% kills. Given no other modifiers. Because of the rule of 10. So, this infantry is going to go from 10 to 15. That cuts the attack power of tanks in half. So where they could have potentially gotten 10 kills, they're now only going to get 5 kills. That's, you know, that's massive. You're halving your incoming damage. Um, and if you get to strike first, then you may stop almost all damage entirely. So never underestimate the, uh, the, plus, the plus stat heroes are, and the plus stat abilities are very, very strong. And of course, if you're in a mountain or, uh, well, tanks can't attack into mountains, but if you're in a hill... I think there's another five, five, five defense to be had there as well. In which case, you're reducing the incoming damage from uh, five to about one. So that's even better. Okay, ambusher is another uh, trait that was um, uh, was proposed in an early version of Panzer Corps. It doesn't do anything. It does not do anything. So. Um, we might as well just dump it straight into F. Because um, obviously ambushes are triggered by moving into units you can't see. I think that there was a time that maybe certain units would have camouflage built in. But then that would... But then if you blundered onto them you would still trigger an ambush. And you can't move onto a unit that you can see. So this ability doesn't make any sense anymore. So it was a thought. Artillery support. You definitely can get this on a hero. This is one of the best heroes in the game. It turns any unit into an artillery piece uh, for defensive purposes, and that is extremely strong. If you get a couple of these, and you put them on tanks, and move them next to each other, then any soft unit that attacks those tanks is going to be annihilated before it can do anything. I mean, the thing is, this hero is, is game changing, it totally changes the way that you play, because artillery has the problem that it suppresses, that it can't move and attack, for the most part, I mean there are ways of getting around it. Um, and a lot of, and it has high cost value, so all the good artillery is four, five, six slots. But with Artillery Support Hero, you can put the Artillery Support Hero on a two slot flame tank and put that flame tank next to your front line and that flame tank is gonna barbecue anyone who dares to attack your front line with a soft unit. You can also put it on infantry and it's just as strong there because you know, for example, if you have if you have two of them on two groups of engineers, any counterattacks by enemy infantry are going to result in you getting a free and extremely hurt, you know, extremely painful attack on the enemy before they can do anything. It's truly a great ability. It will actually, if you've got enough of them and you put them on like 21 centimeter guns, you could actually become invincible because on a 21 centimeter gun. The weakness of a 21 centimeter gun, other than air, obviously, is uh, that it doesn't have anti-soft. But if you put it on a 21 centimeter gun, then you suddenly have anti-soft, anti-tank, and anti-artillery all in the same on the same unit. And if you had two of them and put those units next to each other, there would be literally no way to attack them without being massacred. You could then put an anti-aircraft gun next to those artillery units. And you would literally have a group of units that could not be damaged. 
So there is potential if you have a few of these to create an unbreakable group of units that the AI could literally do nothing about. Um, the funny part is offensively is not as good it's not as good as it would be defensively. There aren't many defensive missions in Panzercore yet. But uh, it, it gets it only gets more powerful in a defensive capacity. So <laughs> easily one of the best heroes in the game. Um, if you had enough of these, you might be able to potentially retire some of your artillery, freeing up slots for an even bigger army. Um, although, you know, support is not the only reason you take artillery along, but it is the main reason. Next, AT support. This is actually a frustratingly weak ability, in a way. It's still decent. The problem is... So this is the same. This is the same as artillery support. Um, I wish I could split this into two because there's. If you have this ability on any unit in the anti-tank class, so that includes anti-tank, anti-air, um, and tanks. I think definitely anti-tank and anti-air. Oh, just anti-tank and anti-air. If you have this on those classes of units, they do not defend each other or themselves. So your unit with AT support provides great defense against uh, for other units, but not itself. So anti-tank guns are actually extremely vulnerable to being to being attacked directly, where this ability can be circumvented easily. You see, you can't circumvent this. If you have two artillery support units next to each other and a soft unit attacks, one will defend the other. But if you have two AT units next to each other and one of them gets attacked by a tank, the other one will not help it, will not defend it. Now, there is an exception to this, and the exception is when AT support is on a piece of artillery. When it's on a piece of artillery, then it does they will support each other and they will and therefore you don't have this vulnerability so this ability is it it its value changes as to which unit it's on if it's on an anti tank gun or an anti aircraft gun which is where you're going to find it 99% of the time then it's really a kind of b grade ability but on a on an artillery piece or any other unit like infantry recon or tank uh, then it's super potent. So the hero version of this is probably S tier. The, the AT and anti-aircraft version of this is B tier. I cannot split this into two. So you'll just have to keep that in mind. Um, I'll leave it in S because if you get it as a hero, then it's fantastic. And you can get it as a hero. It is possible to get it as a hero. So, if you get it as a hero, then it's great. Because you can put it on a tank. Or, uh... Or, uh, infantry unit, or recon car, or, or whatever you want. Although it wouldn't be useful. Wouldn't be useful on infantry. Because they don't have good hard attack values. It would probably work out best on a tank. That way it would support other tanks and other units nearby. But, if you had two of them, those tanks would support each other. But just be aware that 80 units that, that are genuine anti-tank class, they don't help each other. And so you're missing out on one of the greatest reasons to have this capability. Yeah, I'll actually leave it in A. In between the two to show its dual nature. Bridging unit! I mean, it just, you know, lets you cross rivers, man. Pretty, pretty simple. Now most of the maps are designed in such a way that rivers are not the biggest, the biggest deal. Um, but hey, if you need to cross a river, put a bridging unit in the river. But all the units that have this trait are awful. 
and the ability itself is not fantastic because it's not like in games where you must have bridging to cross rivers. You can cross small rivers without bridging and uh, I do it all the time. It's necessary for large rivers but large rivers are quite rare. Once again you can always look at the map to determine whether you need any bridging units but uh, in, terms of an, of, uh, in terms of it being an ability it's not that great. And it's also difficult to use because bridging units still suffer the movement penalty for going into rivers. So they can't easily maneuver into a river a lot of the time. You have to park next to the river and then move into it, especially for large rivers. So anyway. Okay, Bunker Killer. This is probably the only plus stat ability that's not good. <laughs> structures are extremely rare. And they're not, structures are generally speaking not that dangerous. Or it can be avoided. Um, incredibly whatever ability comes on um, comes on engineers by default but uh, certainly nothing exciting I mean bunkers usually you just want to smash them with dive bombers or artillery and then move in with some tanks to finish the job you can clear them with engineers which have bunker killer but you're going to take losses anyway um, the only thing is, if you get this on a hero, you could, uh, you, if you, and you know you're expecting a lot of bunkers, you could put it on a dive bomber, and you would uh, be a lot more lethal against uh, against the bunkers. You'd be able to clear them a lot faster. But that's a really niche. A niche situation, so I don't really rate that that highly. Camouflage! Oh, so good. So, camouflage makes it so that a unit cannot be seen unless there is a unit directly next to it, or it's in the vision radius of a unit with the recon ability. Now, where camouflage becomes truly hilarious is when you put it on an anti-aircraft gun, uh, especially, you know, a very spicy anti-aircraft gun. Uh, the AI does not learn its lesson with camouflage. And what it will do is it will fly in, think, oh, these units are undefended, so I'll bomb them. Then your camouflaged anti-aircraft gun will appear, kill that, kill that AI plane, and then the AI, AI will be like, oh, those units are undefended, and it will send another plane. It is it is possible with the correct deployment of a camouflage anti-aircraft gun to wipe out the entire air force of the AI on turn one as they suicide themselves into it. You can literally run the ammunition out of your, uh, your anti-aircraft gun slaying enemy aircraft using a camouflaged anti-aircraft gun. Now, it can be used in the same kind of way with an anti-tank gun or an artillery piece, but it's much more difficult, <clears throat> because if an enemy recon car comes forward, they'll see it, and once it's been seen, then uh, the AI will know it's there, so they won't suicide themselves into your units, but there is potential to get some some serious capability out of it on, uh, on anti-tank and artillery, but as I covered in a video on exploits, the camouflaged anti-aircraft gun trick is truly game-changing. There is no other way to completely annihilate so utterly the enemy's air force than with a camouflaged anti-aircraft gun, especially if it's got some other <clears throat> serious offensive bonuses. Um, and it's also just incredibly funny to watch. <laughs> it's incredibly funny to watch five or six planes suicide themselves. Okay, capturable. That is just a unused ability, so nothing important there. Carpet bombing. This is the ability of strategic bombers, and it is it's uh, pretty decent. Underestimated by people. Um basically, when you bomb someone with a strat bomber, they lose 
half their fuel rounded down and half their ammo rounded down. Um, <clears throat> but you can't remove someone's last point of ammo or fuel. Um, but in big encirclements, or if you've encircled a very dangerous unit, carpet bombing away its ammunition is actually a very solid uh, move. Additionally, uh, carpet bombing away their fuel can cause them to surrender. So, <clears throat> you could you can potentially carpet bomb someone's fuel away down to like one point or no points. A unit with no fuel that gets attacked, even for a single point of damage that is fully suppressed, will surrender. So, there is a potential to use a lot of low-grade strat bombers to uh, bomb fuel away from from enemy units that are not easy to surround <clears throat> and uh, after a single attack or maybe two attacks their fuel will run out they'll actually just immediately surrender so quite useful strat bombers are quite useful they're they're underestimated I think and they're quite cheap slots wise so you can obtain this quite easily close combat truly a game defining trait uh, close combat forces the use of the close combat defense rating, which is usually awful. Now, it's not just infantry. It's also... So everyone knows about, or mostly everybody knows about close combat and infantry. Um, when you fight infantry in a close combat tile, they have access to your close combat defense rating which is usually terrible and that allows their low attack values to be useful but there are also anti-aircraft guns that have the same capability which is <clears throat> this one low altitude attack works exactly the same way allowing access to the close combat defense of a flying unit which is usually horrible, or zero, in fact. So if you look at the rule of ten, like if, if you look at these guns and you say, oh, you know, they've only got like six air, air attack or whatever, or eight air attack, that's not much. I mean, it isn't, but against, against a defense of zero, it's lethal. <clears throat> so that's how that works. We'll, we'll probably see that ability later anyway. You'll always want to play careful, pay careful attention to close combat tiles. If people are getting massacred, it's usually because they don't understand the close combat system. So. <coughs> Next, counter battery fire. This is actually kind of useless. The only reason why is... <clears throat> it only works, you can, you can get this as a hero, it only works if the unit has range, which means it only works on artillery. The thing is, the artillery that has got good range has already got it. The 17cm and 21cm guns have already got this ability, so you don't really want to add it with a hero, that doesn't make any sense. The only unit that potentially this is worth having on is a 15 centimeter gun because a 15 centimeter gun has got some reasonable range um, and it doesn't have counter battery so you can add counter battery to a 15 centimeter gun and get usefulness against all all attack types but the issue is the enemy has to be within range for it to work so if an enemy 15 centimeter gun if I just demonstrate here If I have a 15 centimeter gun here, if I have counter battery on this 15 centimeter gun, it can only hit enemies within this ring. So what that means is, is that if the enemy's 15 centimeter gun is here, or here, or here on these hills, Counter battery won't work because it's out of range. 
So counter battery will only trigger if the enemy is close enough to hit the 15 centimeter gun so that the 15 centimeter gun can hit it, but doesn't target the 15 centimeter gun. The thing is, the AI, an AI 15 centimeter gun that's in range, will target will target your artillery before targeting anything else. And if it's out of range, the ability won't trigger. So it's useless. <laughs> Unless you have like two 15 centimeter guns with it on, then there's a potential that one will defend the other. But even then, it's unlikely. Basically, because of the way that the AI works, this is actually a very, very weak, if not useless, ability. In fact, honestly, D is probably too generous for it. I would drop it down to E. Unless you combine it with Kloss. Kloss, Kloss is a special hero in the Grand Campaign that adds range. If you, add it, if you combine it with her, then you might get enough range on a 15cm gun to actually get some utility out of this. But otherwise, it's useless. <clears throat> and it's definitely useless on anything other than the artillery. Because nothing else has got range. So it just doesn't work. Double attack. A hero that is more highly rated than than it deserves. So this might be a bit controversial here. I don't rate double attack that highly, and I'll tell you why. It does not increase the power of your unit. It simply allows you to use your unit twice. And the second usage is not... It's, it's difficult to actually get value out of the second usage. So, <clears throat> if I'm a tank and I'm facing another tank, and I do three damage to them and they do three damage to me, all double attack does is allow me to then do another battle where I do like two damage to them because obviously we both lost three health and they do two damage to me. It's not improving <clears throat> it's not improving the uh, the attack power of my unit at all. It's just letting me use it twice. Now maybe on a piece of artillery it would be useful to shoot twice but you can potentially burn through your ammo quite fast doing that. Although that's that's a marginal issue. Um, if you double attack, if you attack an enemy and destroy them, double attack does not give you another move. And if you attack an enemy and you don't destroy them, but you do heavy damage to them, the, ch the chances are that they'll retreat away from you. Which means that your double attack, you unless there's another enemy nearby to attack, you won't be able to use your double attack because you won't be able to move again. And of course, if you crush the enemy with something like a tank, you're going to trigger overrun anyway. So then your double attack is not that useful. <clears throat> Likewise, with uh, bombers and dive bombers, your only option, unless you've got double move, is to strike the same enemy twice, which a lot of the time means that the second attack is wasted. Now, I would elevate this to an A if you combine it with a repair hero, field repairs, or um, field uh, medic. Because it means that your second attack is never wasted, and it's so easy to waste your second attack. It's actually quite, you have to really think about how you're going to use your second attack. It's so easy to waste your second attack. Um, but. With a field repair hero, or a field medic hero, that healing triggers as long as you have your attack left over. So you can um, you can always get use out of your double attack by constantly repairing your unit, which is actually very powerful, especially in the grand campaign where you have limited amounts of very very powerful uh, units. You can uh, constantly heal. But this, unlike these, which completely change the outcomes of battles, or result in the annihilation of units that blunder in, this does not, it does not improve your actual combat capability at all. 
It's just kind of like having a restricted, you know, copy of the unit that you're using. Um, so it's not as strong as people make it out of, like, two attacks, great! S-tier hero. It, it genuinely isn't. It's actually much harder to use than you would think. It's much harder to get value out of it than you would you would think. So, pretty decent on artillery, and decent on units when combined with other perks, or uh, especially self-repair. Because self-repair triggers as long as you've got your attack left. As long as you've got an attack left over. So double attack allows you to attack and repair on the same turn. Double move. Combines nicely with double attack. Sort of useful on aircraft. There are, in the grand campaign, there are a couple of heroes that have got double attack. And double move allows them to actually get better utility out of their double attack. Double move is also interestingly useful on a recon plane since it allows you to actually scout a wider area. The thing is... It doesn't... Um, it doesn't increase the amount of movement points you have. So... If you had dreams of actually moving twice as much distance, those dreams are going to be dashed. If it if it had that capability, it would be a much better hero, but it doesn't. You know, once again, double attack and double move, these are heroes that need to be combined with other heroes to actually get get value out of them. They don't stand they don't stand strongly on their own. Entrenchment killer 2x Hot garbage. Basically, when you attack, you destroy two points of entrenchment. Um, really not useful. <laughs> comes on, comes on weak strat bombers and artillery. It's useful on those, but as a hero, it's an awful hero. It's an awful hero. If you have trench slog on. Then I would elevate it to like D tier, D tier. But uh, most of you are probably not using trench slog. Likewise, entrenchment killer three X. This is this is where we start to get towards real entrenchment busting. With trench slog on, this is uh, this is a blessing because it's going to allow you to actually remove entrenchment that you can't touch. Entrenchment slog as a trait is really painful because most units only do one entrenchment damage per attack and um, with with uh, uh, trench slog it's zero so you can only mo remove entrenchment with artillery and strat bombers and this allows you to widen your uh, your toolbox in uh, what you can use to bust entrenchment Likewise, 4x is is actually pretty solid. This is great on a fighter plane. If you've got like a double attack, double move fighter plane, once you've cleaned out, <clears throat> once you've cleaned out all the enemies on the map, all the uh, enemy aircraft, you're often for a want of something for your fighter plane to do. What this does is it allows you to use a fighter plane that otherwise wouldn't be doing much in the way of you know being useful to you. And allows you to take that fighter plane and go and shred our uh, entrenchment with it. Um, allowing you to then move in with your ground forces to remove highly entrenched units out of cities and all that kind of thing. So there's real potential for these two on a fighter plane. But uh, they're still not fantastic abilities. They're just... 4x is, is very solid on a fighter you can uh, you can find good utility on your fighter after the enemy air has been cleaned out with uh, entrenchment killer 4x and I have done in some campaigns but still not great <clears throat> envelopment the inferior version of shock tactics a solid B grade hero 
If you attack a unit that would have retreated, it surrenders. Very great for farming equipment. Doesn't help you particularly offensively. It is more of a economic hero, allowing you to farm enemy units. Um, but it can be useful. It does have some utility offensively. You know, if you are just trying to bust your way through the enemy, there is an opportunity there to hit an enemy unit very hard and then have it surrender instead of run away and be a pain in the backside. So, it's strictly inferior to shock tactics. Because <clears throat> it just it, it only works on the unit that's attacking. Unlike shock tactics that works for any unit, but we'll explain that when we get to shock tactics. Okay, fighter support. This is the... Uh, standard ability of fighters, which means that any unit next to them will be um, any air unit next to them will be protected. They'll shoot at um, enemy fighters that are attacking nearby um, torpedo bombers or strat bombers. The problem with fighter support, it's got the same issue as AT support, but even worse. Fighters do not defend each other. And so enemy fighters will just go directly after your fighters, which means that 90% of the time this doesn't trigger and is useless. The only way you can force it is with a little exploit, which uh, the aircraft flower, if you will, exploit, where you put a fighter in one hex and then you surround that hex with dive bombers, strat bombers and recon planes so that the enemy cannot maneuver toward to attack your fighter directly. They have to attack something else, which allows your fighter to get a free hit. But most of the time, fighter support is kind of useless because enemy fighters will just go after your fighters directly. And uh, you put two fighters next to each other, they won't defend each other. Just like with anti-tank guns. So this is an ability that would be nice if it worked if it worked in a group of fighters, but it doesn't. I'm not sure you can get it as a hero. But if you could get it as a hero, it would be good on... Certain dive bombers have actually got good air-to-air -air capability. And that would enable them to support each other. Much like artillery supports each other. So it could be very powerful as a hero, but I don't think it's available as a hero. I think it's only a trait of fighters. Forced March makes infantry a bit quicker. It's just a normal ability. Nothing too exciting. If you if you use normal infantry, then you'll probably use it all the time. Um, not much to say about it. You gain a movement point once every two turns. Can be useful. Glider, this is unused. Nothing to talk about here. I think the idea behind Glider was that Motorbike Recon was going to be able to uh, deploy anywhere like paratroopers, but it never came to pass. <clears throat> Ignores Entrenchment! Incredibly powerful ability. So Entrenchment, most people don't understand Entrenchment. Entrenchment reduces incoming damage by 10% per point. 8% if the unit is infantry, if the attacker is infantry, and 2% if the unit has the suppressive fire trait. So, that would be artillery and strat bombers, usually. <clears throat> now, there is entrenchment everywhere. Pretty much everywhere that's not a road tile on a plane. So when you attack a unit in a city, for example, and it has three it has the lowest possible entrenchment, which for some cities is three, for others it's five. That is reduced. That is reducing your accuracy by 30% or 50% respectively, if you're using tanks. <clears throat> if you're using infantry, it's 8% per point, so three points would be um, 24%. And it would be uh, 34, 42, 42% for, uh, for five. 
So the ability to ignore entrenchment is going to give you an extra 30 to 50% attack in a lot of cases. And against enemies that are actually fully entrenched, it's going to be, you know, they're going to have 100% damage reduction from most units, 80% reduction from infantry, and 20% reduction from artillery and strat bombers. <clears throat> it's going to it's gonna take that down to zero. Um, the greatest thing about entrenchment is not just that it gives you a massive attack bonus, it uh, uh, ignores entrenchment. It also helps you when you most need help. When you have a very powerful unit in a very fortified position, this hero most enables you to deal with that problem. So when you most need the ability to destroy a unit, a very dangerous unit in a very good position, Ignores Entrenchment is the ultimate ability to do that damage. <clears throat> it's also very powerful on dive bombers for exactly the same reason. 10 out of 10 Entrenchment prevents a dive bomber from doing any damage at all because it does not have the uh, suppressive damage trait, so it, it doesn't have the reduced... Um, it doesn't reduce the effectiveness of Entrenchment. But with Ignores Entrenchment you can go straight over to units that are 10 out of 10 entrenched and instead of doing no damage you can do devastating damage more damage than if they weren't entrenched because even if their bonus entrenchment has been smashed down you still have base entrenchment of one or two or three points sometimes more uh, in a fortification tile I think it's five as well so this, this is the ability that most enables you to do your full damage to the enemy. <clears throat> very, very powerful on pretty much any unit. Especially when combined with other things. Ignore zone of control. I don't rate it personally. It's nice for surrounding. It's nice if you've got power four. If you're doing power four stuff. <clears throat> the only thing is, is that, you know, running units behind enemy lines is always dangerous. If you're getting zone of control really badly by the enemy, you've usually done something wrong. But it does have its usefulness. It does have, you know, especially if you are trying to encircle and capture, it definitely has its utility there doesn't improve the attack value of your unit in any way. Kind of useful for also getting out of a sticky situation, but you probably shouldn't be in a sticky situation in the first place, so... Yeah, it's alright. Consolidator. This is an immensely powerful hero, which I never get. <clears throat> so, it allows you to have five more units in your stack. It's incredibly potent. Because five more units is five more hit points, is five more attacks. Um, and because the most damage that one unit can do is one, one damage, this increases your ability to do damage by five units. This enables tanks to overstrength to 20, which allows them to clean out infantry in a single blast relatively easily, let alone other tanks. This combines amazingly with zero slots, allowing you to get a 20 out of 20 unit for free. <clears throat> but even without zero slots, it's incredibly potent. For example, some anti-aircraft guns, especially small caliber ones, have very, very inexpensive slot costs. For example, the 2cm Flak or the 2cm Flak Verling has a rapid fire 2x and can be brought up to 15 strength for just 2 slots. This will allow you to bring it up to 20 strength for 3 slots. 20 strength with double strike is 40 attacks. It's gonna absolutely annihilate any uh, aircraft that's not a strat bomber. So you don't just have to use Consolidator on expensive units with zero slots. You can also use it 
on inexpensive units to get incredibly huge stacks. Uh, bridge Engineers is another good target and uh, Motorbike Motorbike Infantry, because Motorbike Infantry are quietly one of the best units in the game. They have the same 11 uh, soft attack and 7 hard attack as uh, standard infantry does. But they only cost 2 slots. You can bring them up to 15 strength for 4 slots, which makes them the same stack size as an infantry unit, but you can take them up to 20 for 6. And I think 20 for 6 is cheaper, yeah. 20 for 6 is cheaper than um, 20 in standard infantry. Oh, it's the same. But motorbikes are faster. <clears throat> and more useful. And have better traits. So there's many uses for Consolidator. But most of you, if you get Consolidator, you'll want to combine it with zero slots. Which allows you to get a free... A free 20 of 20 strength unit, which is terrifying. I think any unit that's 20 out of 20 is going to be pretty terrifying. <coughs> Kamikaze, it's a uh, unit dies after you use it. It's on the Goliath bomb and the V2 rocket. It's like an anti-ability, man. You, you do not want that. Low altitude attack, we discussed this before. This is close combat. For, uh, for aircraft. It's a very potent trait. I don't think you can get it as a hero. You might, once again, you might see it as a hero trait in mods. If you were to get it in mods, put it on an 8.8 centimeter gun and watch, watch planes disappear. Low profile. It's a minus 20% accuracy bonus against a unit. This is very solid. Especially on a soft unit like infantry. <clears throat> this just straight up prevents damage. For a 5 star enemy unit, it prevents 20% of their damage. But for a base, um, a base experience unit, it actually prevents 40%. Because a base experience unit has got 50% accuracy and this bonus is linear so it takes their accuracy from 50% to 30 um, dramatically reducing their ability to do damage to you so it's very potent defensive ability could be useful on units like anti-aircraft guns and artillery but generally speaking you just you want to protect those units properly in the first place infantry is always on the front line getting wrecked <clears throat> and that is where this really shines on engineers, for example. Engineers can take a fair bit of punishment during their standard role. But low profile will prevent them from taking too many casualties. Rapid Fire 1x. Strictly inferior to uh, Consolidator. In that plus five units. Well, it depends. Actually, it does. It does depend. Basically, if you've got ten attacks, you get fifteen. If you've got twenty attacks, you're gonna get thirty. It's a very, very solid um, attack trait. It does not stack. There are units that already have it, like recon cars and anti-aircraft guns. It doesn't stack, so don't put it on those. Usually it's best on tanks, because tanks have got small stack sizes. They're quite expensive to increase the stack size. Um, but it's a great hero. Very solid damage. And if you over-strengthen the unit, you get more utility out of it. Combines beautifully with pretty much everything here. Military Engineer. This is um, Ignores Entrenchment for Engineers. Uh, only on Engineers, of course. It's identical to Ignores Entrenchment. So, not much to say that I didn't say about Ignores Entrenchment, but if you get a hero, it will be Ignores Entrenchment. 
this is the innate ability of engineers, but it's a great ability. Minesweeper. This is a uh, completely niche, completely niche trait on like I think one tank that has anti uh, mine capability. Mines are easy to deal with in Panzer Corps too. Very easy to deal with. So who cares? Once again, minefields. This is just an internal ability, really, but minefields are not exciting in Panzer Corps two. Um, if you blunder into one, you're going to take like one point of damage. Who cares? Engineers uh, have the minesweeper trait and can remove mines completely in one go. But uh, mines are really, really not a problem, so I wouldn't worry about it too much. No attack after move. This is the anti-trait of artillery. Get around it with rapid deployment. Unit does not entrench. I mean, this is another internal internal ability. Um, it's on bunkers and buildings. Nothing you need to worry about. For some reason we got no move after attack in here twice. No overstrength. This is really painful. I would not want to be on the receiving end of no overstrength. It's uh. I think it can be seen on certain, like, single entity gift units. But I really like Overstrength, so I, you know, this would be horrible. No Replace, this is usually what you just see um, on buildings. Buildings can't be repaired. A horrible ability, but you'll never find it on any of your units. Okay, no Retaliation. This is a pretty good ability. I would say it's A grade. The only problem with no retaliation is it doesn't help you with entrenchment. So, um, it's useful. It's it's best used in infantry war. Because infantry do, do a lot of damage to each other. So no retaliation would prevent return fire from enemy infantry. But this does not stop things like artillery and anti-tank guns from hitting you. So it's not as useful as you would think it is. But it's still pretty useful. It's also useful in tank-on-tank -tank battles. Because tanks can usually wound each other pretty badly. So no retaliation would prevent return fire. But once again, this does not make your unit more powerful in any way. In fact, I'd almost be tempted to put it down here. Because it does not it does not make your unit more powerful in any way. It just prevents you from receiving enemy da damage from the enemy. So if you couldn't if you couldn't clear a particular enemy before, no retaliation is not going to allow you to clear them after either. But it's useful. It's definitely useful, especially for uh, for soft units like infantry that take a lot of return fire. It's quite powerful. But generally speaking, you want to build your units to just kill the enemy. And if you're killing the enemy in one go, then you're generally speaking not going to take a lot of return fire. Unless it's an infantry fight. No retreat. Kinda of degrade. It's useful in uh, defensive battles. If you've got infantry in cities that must be held at all costs, then it's quite useful. It's useful for uh, putting on bridge engineer. If you're using like bridge engineers to hold cities, it's useful on them because it will stop them from running away, which will allow you to. Uh, hold on to the town, whatever town it is you're trying to hold on to, allow you to hold on to it for a bit longer, or a lot longer in some cases. <clears throat> so it has its uses defensively, but I, I, it's not, it's not great. No surrender, just suffers the same issue as no retreat. 
Um, it is strictly inferior. Uh, no, it's strictly superior to no retreat. But that's not saying much. You know, once again, might be situationally useful on throwaway units in defensive positions. Right, no upgrade, that's just an internal ability, so I wouldn't worry about that. Just means you can't upgrade. Some uh, units like Gustav, I think, have that to stop you from changing the unit. Unit can't be split, that usually happens on single entity things, once again, like the uh, rail the railgun. Can't split it into two bits because it's single entity. No supply <sighs> would be useful if, <sighs> like in multiplayer it would be useful where, you know, in multiplayer people are always trying to encircle each other and no supply would be very powerful. So it's not a bad, it's not a bad trait, it's not a bad ability in that situation, but Generally speaking, if you're letting your guys get encircled, then you're in big trouble. Where it might become much more useful is if you put it on some paratroopers and you knew that you were going to send these paratroopers behind enemy lines in a big way. Then it would be very useful for them so that they could stay supplied behind enemy lines. But that's a very niche usage of that. Okay, no zone of control. This is a trait that uh, is on landmines. Just means a unit doesn't project zone of control. You shouldn't find that on any of your units. Um, yeah, very much an anti-trait. Overrun. The overrun hero is amazing. <clears throat> it. Uh, if you kill the enemy unit entirely without taking any damage, you overrun it. But if you overrun 25 units in this manner, you get Steamroller. And Steamroller means that if you kill a unit, you get another turn. And this is an amazing ability. Now, it used to be the case that you, because tanks come with this ability, it used to be the case that you would use overrun on tanks to get Steamroller and then switch that to another unit type <clears throat> so you could have steamroller on artillery steamroller on everything <clears throat> the overrun hero was needed to get steamroller on infantry however now that ex it was considered an exploit it's been fixed so now the um, overrun hero is the only way to get steamroller on infantry or artillery or any other unit that's not a tank. Which makes it an incredibly valuable and coveted hero. Because Steamroller has two abilities, but it's strictly better than double attack. <clears throat> when you Steamroller an enemy, so when you kill an enemy in one go, you get your attack back, but you also get your move back. <clears throat> Not only do you get your attack and your move back, but if the enemy would have done return damage to you in a in a straight up combat, they do no damage. So, for example, say you take a group of tanks and you face off against, say, a big powerful anti-tank gun, and you would kill that anti-tank gun but it would do 4 damage to you. If you do kill the anti-tank gun in one hit directly <clears throat> with steamroller, that 4 damage won't you won't receive that 4 damage. You you'll actually just take no damage. So, it allows you to kill enemy units without ever taking any damage. Effectively combining aspects, all the best aspects of no retaliation <clears throat> double move and double attack all, all being compressed onto one unit 
Um, it's fantastically powerful on artillery. Uh, but it's not bad on infantry either. Great hero if you can get one. I, I never ever seem to get one. I know you can get one. But I have not been that lucky. Okay, overwhelming attack makes an enemy retreat even if you do one damage to them. Powerful in its own right. Much more powerful when combined with envelopment or shock tactics. But still great on its own. Um, just note that it doesn't work if the enemy has any level of entrenchment over the baseline. So it's not as useful as as you think reading the description, but it's still insanely useful. Paratroopers, you can drop anywhere. Standard ability of paratroopers. Nothing to see here. Just allows paratroopers to drop wherever they want to drop. Phased movement. You can get this as a hero. And it's a reasonably decent ability. Comes on recons as standard. You can get it. If you do get it, it's best on a tank. Or if you have infantry with aggressive deployment, then it can come into its own because... <clears throat> infantry with aggressive deployment can actually use their transports to move a lot of distance and still attack. So combine that with phase movement and you can actually uh, you can shuffle your infantry around as if it was a recon car which is quite cool. If you were to combine phase movement with um, something like steamroller or double attack it, it 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 better enables you to use things like double attack or steamroller because it allows you to move around after making your first attack so that you can actually then reposition for a second attack so a good combo hero um, solid hero on infantry for maneuvering but once again doesn't increase the attack power of your units at all so not really worthy of any slot higher than B Oh boy, we got so many, <laughs> so many more to go. Okay, precision weapon. 20% base accuracy. Extremely potent. Um, but its potency will drop off with... Um, once you hit 5 stars, you hit 100% accuracy. Then it's not that useful. However, on generalismus mode, it will still be useful. I think like one one hero comes with that. I'm not sure if you can get it as a random hero, but it's pretty it's pretty decent, especially early in the war. Um I would drop it down to B or C once you reach the point that everyone's got five star units. Then the extra accuracy is actually not that useful anymore. However, one thing I would say about that just going back on accuracy is addition there is one unit that benefits for addition uh, benefits from additional accuracy over 100% and that is artillery <clears throat> artillery does more kills with with more accuracy so you could still get use out of it on your artillery even if everyone's throwing five star units around even if it's like 1944 and everyone's throwing five star units around <clears throat> Rapid Fire 2x. Don't think you can get this as a random drop anymore. Ridiculously potent offensive hero. Not much to say. Doubles the attack power of your unit. Which um, is terrifying. Hugely superior to double attack. Especially on a unit with um, Overrun or Steamroller. Could just allow you to plow your way through um, an entire, you know, wall of units. I believe my flamethrower tank of doom was a combination of rapid fire 2x, um, 
it had Ignora's Entrenchment as standard. And then uh, I think I was using um, No Retaliation to make sure that it didn't take Return Fire. And on the roll. And I just... I could just pick three units a turn and just delete them. So, pretty obviously hugely potent capability. Uh, Recon Plane, uh, you know, Recon Planes are pretty useful. I throw them away all the time. This is the ability that allows them to improve the accuracy of units attacking what's underneath them, which <clears throat> honestly is not that useful. I don't really use it that often. You know, once again, it's about whether accuracy is actually going to make any difference or not. And also, if a recon plane is hovering above an enemy unit, that means that a bomber or a strat, you know, a strat bomber or a dive bomber cannot be in that spot. So, not that useful. Same for recon. Obviously, it comes with your recon cars, improves accuracy for your recon cars. I wouldn't chase after the recon bonuses personally. It's it's better to sort of be where you need to be to get good hits than to maneuver all your recon cars around one unit to get an incredible bonus and then end up wasting attacks because you've used up your movement points. So just keep that in mind. Also remember that the use of these recon abilities does... If a unit receives that bonus then the recon car or plane will receive experience, but not the greatest amount of experience. Shock Tactics is the directly superior version of Envelopment. <clears throat> Interestingly, it works from the air, so it's another great, great one to put on fighter planes. If a fighter plane strafes a unit with Shock Tactics, that unit now has no movement. So then if it's forced to retreat, for whatever reason, it will surrender. Um, but unlike envelopment, which only affects the unit that is making the attack, Shock Tactics deletes the unit's movement for the rest of the turn. So effectively, it provides envelopment to every other unit that you have. Um, so it's it's directly superior to envelopment um, and very powerful on pretty much anything that you can think of. It even works on artillery. You can you can shoot someone with artillery with shock tactics, thus deleting their movement and suppressing them. <clears throat> and then another unit comes in and triggers the retreat; they will surrender. So it's a great ability with lots of offensive application. Single Entity, you'll find it on trains and ships and such. <coughs> Just means that the unit always attacks as if it had full strength. However, it does not stop the pips from being suppressed. So if a Single Entity unit has 5 suppression on it, it's not going to attack as if it has 10 strength. It's going to attack as if it has 5. So, once again, not as useful as you would think. But hey, it's uh, it's a built-in trait. I don't think you can ever get it as a hero. So, if you could get it as a hero, once again, maybe mods, it would be incredibly potent. Because uh, infantry being single entity would be hilarious, especially with something like Consolidator. <clears throat> single shot. This is an anti-trait. V2 rockets and such have this ability. They just disappear after being used. Splitter is all units can split now. This is an unused, an unused trait. Suppressing fire is the anti-trait of artillery and strat bombers, where 20% of their attack is lethal and the other 80% is suppressive. Not much you can do about it, really. Um, but improved accuracy offsets it somewhat. But the real way to get rid of this horrible ability is uh, with lethal. 
AA support. I'm not sure why this is in here twice, because we've definitely done this one. So I'll just drop this here. Aggressive counterattack we've done. Aiming assistance we've done. All terrain we've done. Have these like repeated themselves for some reason? Okay, whatever. Alpine we've done, ambusher we've done. Amphibious is kinda useless. I would put it at like E. Um, you get uh, you can get the river assault hero that gives you this trait basically removes the um, the penalty for being in a river tile <clears throat> but one of the greatest penalties of being in river tile is that you have no entrenchment there and your movement is hampered and that still happens so it's a pretty bad ability and I would just you know if you get if you get river assault as a hero, my, cons my condolences, because it's really just an awful hero. You don't want to be, even with this, you don't want to be in the river tile. You just don't. Okay, artillery support we've done. AT support we've done. Uh, Avenger is a weird one. It's not bad. But it's not good. So what Avenger does is it gives you an attack bonus for each point of damage you've taken on a very big unit like a consolidated infantry or something that attack bonus can grow to be really really good really potent but the problem is you can only get you can only get a kill for each unit that's alive so if you have a 20 strength unit and it's down to 5 strength you got a 15, 15 attack bonus. That's great. But you can only do 5 kills because you've only got 5 units that are alive. And you definitely don't want to keep your units in a fragile, you know, almost dead state. So it's, uh, it's not that great. But, but to be fair to it, you know, if you have a 15 or 20 strength unit and you've lost 5 points of health... So it's down to 15 from 20. <clears throat> or it's down to 10 from 15. That's still a pretty potent bonus. Okay, bridging unit we've done. Bunker killer we have done. Butcher. This is one of the best traits in the game. And I wouldn't say it's game changing, but it's a solid A grade. Once again, it's rule of 10. So... Plus 5 attack is very potent, especially for units that do not have great attack values in the first place. For example, go back to our game. If you look at infantry, you'll notice that most of them have got an air defense value of 9 or 8. Then if you go to uh, things like fighters... You'll notice that most of these fighters have only got a value of 3, maybe 4. Well, obviously, 3 plus 5 is 8. So, with Butcher, a fighter can suddenly get kills on infantry. Get a couple of kills. Instead of basically doing nothing. But with Tactical Bombers, it's even better. Because with Tactical Bombers, you have... A lot of soft values of around 8 or 7 or 9 or 10. So if you look at this one, for example, which is 10. Well, 10 versus 8 or 10 versus 9 means that over 10 attacks, you're going to get 1 or 2 kills. With Butcher, you go from 1 or 2 kills to, you know, 6 or 7 kills. So that's a huge boost in capability. So our dive bombers are not particularly great against infantry normally. With Butcher, they become very dangerous against infantry. It's actually strat bombers that are better against infantry normally, but with Butcher, tactical bombers become much more effective against infantry. And it's not just fighters and tack bombers on which it's useful. 
it's useful on some tanks that are more anti-tank focused especially early in the war where you're sort of looking at stats like this 12 16 early war tanks that don't have the uh, 20 infantry attack value can be boosted nicely by butcher butcher can turn a group of uh, boat engineers into slaying machines that four that four infantry attack is very poor but nine is the same as most early war infantry or at least some of it so it's a very it's very good any stat booster is very good okay camouflage we've discussed I don't know why there are some repeats here but I've got no way of getting rid of them we have discussed this we have discussed this cheap replacements it's an economic hero that just lets you elite reinforce at the price of standard reinforcements uh, but if you are uh, if you're playing the game strongly then you'll uh, you'll never be for want of prestige really so it's not that useful and of all the things that generate prestige it's not that great anyway city fighter plus five attack both soft and hard in city tiles so, not bad. Obviously, best on infantry. Not as exploitable or as useful as Butcher. But uh, if you're, uh, if the map in question is Stalingrad, for example, then uh, this is a great hero. In fact, I mean, if the map is Stalingrad, it's it's actually probably just as good. Well. No, it, I mean, because it has to be on a ground unit. It has to be on infantry or... Uh, it has to be on infantry. If it were on a tank or a recon, you would have to be in a city tile, which is very risky for that type of unit. So it's not nearly as usable as Butcher. Close combat we've discussed. Combat luck. If you play with RNG, then this is pretty solid just prevents you from rolling worse than zero. <clears throat> so if you're on 50% RNG, you can have plus 50% accuracy or you can have minus 50% accuracy. It prevents all the minus values. So the best you can have is between zero and 50%, turning luck into a pure bonus for you. But it does not prevent enemy... It doesn't prevent enemy luck at all. So... It's only useful offensively. It's only useful if you play with RNG. Um, so it's alright. It's, it's okay. Okay, counter battery we've discussed. Crippling blow. It's an interesting one. It is powerful. It's plus five attack, which is always powerful. <clears throat> against any unit with full health. It's good on dive bombers that are going to open up um, open up uh, offensives on tanks for you. Uh, it's just remembering to use it, I guess, is the hardest thing. Is, uh, you know, re always remembering to direct your crippling blow unit to go after a unit that's got uh, full health. So it's more it's more mental arithmetic that you've got to go through to use it effectively, but it's very powerful, um, particularly on dive bombers, where plus five, both against soft and against hard, really opens up what they can go after and how much damage they can do in a single hit. If you combine crippling blow with something like rapid fire 1.5x you might be able to create a situation where your first attack literally just annihilates the target. 
Likewise, for the same reason, it's pretty good on tanks. <clears throat> if you can uh, one-shot your way through the enemy, then you can uh, use Crippling Blow to steamroll your way through an entire line of enemy units. Um, but you're going to need to combo it with other things to, to extract its full potential. But any, any plus stat hero is always going to be very, very good. Distraction. Ugh. It's okay. It's okay on tanks. It prevents anti-tank units from firing. And it prevents artillery from firing. If the distraction unit is next to the attacking unit, it's difficult to use. Because it's not like the unit that has distraction can just go ahead and attack. Um, they'll still enemy units will still defend against the unit with distraction. You have to place the distraction unit next to the unit that's being defended, and then bring in another unit to attack. So it's awkward to use. You can stick it on a recon car and occasionally get utility out of it, but it's not that great. It's it's funny because it's got potential. If it worked for the unit that was actually carrying it, it would be great on tanks. Because then tanks could ignore anti-tank uh, anti guns. But it doesn't. You have to bring along your buddy recon car to actually project it. And I think that you, the recon car or whatever unit you have that's got distraction actually has to be next to the unit that you're supposed to be distracting as well. So... It's really hard to use. It's powerful situationally if you can use it, but it's just a complete nightmare to use. <clears throat> you might as well use Lightning Strike, which is much better. <clears throat> okay, we've discussed double, double, uh, double attack. <clears throat> mass attacks are not that great. And doubling your mass attack is not going to make it any better. I don't think that that is a trait that's in the game, so we'll just ignore it. We've discussed double move, we've discussed double support. No, we haven't discussed double support. Double support is... hmm... It's, it's a pretty decent capability. You can actually unlock it on units that support over time. So you don't need a hero that grants it. Uh, interestingly, double support would be best with... Um, something like a fighter. Because I don't think fighters can get skilled support. So ground units get skilled support. Which gives them 10% when supporting. 10% accuracy when supporting. Then 20% accuracy when supporting. And then eventually double support. I don't think fighters can ever get double support. So if you get it as a hero, and you stick it on a fighter, that fighter becomes much better at defending your your fighters. But you know, once again, it's something that's strictly defensive. It's not going to set your world on fire or anything. Okay, we've discussed entrenchment killer. We've discussed envelopment. Evasive is the same as um, Precise Weapon. I'm pretty sure we spoke about Evasive. Oh, we spoke about Low Profile, which is the superior version of Evasive. It's only 10% as opposed to 20. So, it's uh, inferior to Low Profile, but still, still okay. Expert Recon, I've never seen. Um, I've never seen this hero. Triples the Recon Accuracy bonus. So, I mean, it's going to give you like 10 or 15% accuracy. Very similar to... Um, uh, aiming Assistance. In the same, same area of 
capability as aiming assistance, but I've never seen this as a hero, so it, if it's in, it's quite rare. Okay, expert support, I just spoke about that. This is the one that grants 20% accuracy. Now, interestingly, this one is very powerful, and I'll, I'll explain why. <clears throat> Eventually, you get medals that take you up to double support. So you do like 10 supports or something, you get you get the 10% bonus, you do 20 supports, you get the um, you get the 20% bonus, and then eventually you get double. This stacks with double support. So if you put this on an artillery or an anti-aircraft gun that has double support, it will stack with double support. Those shots will go off with 20% extra accuracy. So on an anti-aircraft gun, it can be very, very potent. Uh, especially if you're using the old camouflage trap. Camouflage trap with expert support can result in a lot of dead aircraft very quickly. Uh, it works with artillery too. If you have artillery with double support, it will enhance that. But just a little bit more difficult to use. Exterminator. Of all the attack bonus heroes, this one is the least capable. You get plus five attack against units that have less than half strength. <clears throat> Not that useful. Less useful than you think it would be. Because already heavily damaged units are usually pretty easy to get rid of. <clears throat> um, still, I mean, it can help you with a steamroller run, I suppose. But the fact that you have to use other units to knock a unit down before this comes into play makes it it makes it difficult to use. It's less useful than you would you would really give it credit for. Um, there is potential for this on a dive bomber because uh, dive bombers, once again, it's it's about the attack values. Low low health or low strength retreating infantry or vehicles could be picked off with a dive bomber with this. So there's definite utility for it, but it's nothing to write home about. Famous, it's just money. It's just money, my friends. It's just money. It's a good source of money, but uh, capturing is a much better source of money. Fast deployment. Very, very solid hero. Allows your infantry to move the full extent of their range and then deploy an attack. Allows artillery to move and attack. For those units, this is a top tier hero. Obviously, it has no use on anything else. All terrain. Oh, wait, how do we go? Fast entrenchment. Truly a joke hero. I, I mean, defensively, I suppose, it's got usefulness, but. Uh, there aren't a lot of defensive. There aren't a lot of defensive battles in the game, and fast entrenchment is not really going to help you anyway. So I don't know, man. It's uh, it's unfortunate. Fast learner, useful at the start of your grand campaign for leveling up your units, but. Doesn't really offer any offensive capability. Useful in the old uh, training missions to get units, level up units super fast. But also in the grand campaign, a lot of the time you're not waiting for um, you're not waiting for experience points to accumulate. You're you're waiting for kills. So you can unlock medals. Infantry and, and tank kills so you can unlock medals. Reaching the experience limit in each section of the, the Grand Campaign is not that difficult. 
But still, it's got utility in training up something quickly. Okay, fast rebase. Um, amusingly powerful with scout planes. If you can... If you can capture a few air bases near near the enemy, you can run your your scout plane between the bases constantly and reveal huge chunks of the map. There is there are some maps like the uh, encirclement of Poland <clears throat> where you can use fast rebase to actually uh, rebase a scout plane across the map repeatedly thus revealing all the terrain. So it's got its uses. But you need to look at your map and see if that is going to be that useful for you. Um, but for a recon plane, this is a great, this is a great perk. Oh. Excuse me, one second. My my nose is itching. <laughs> okay, next, fast retreat, dumpster tier. Um, it's not even worth talking about. Fearsome Reputation. This is a pretty solid hero. I would give, say it's B tier. If you put it on a recon car, then what it does is it, at, at the start of the enemy's turn, they get suppressed by three. It happens right at the start of their turn. So what that means is that no matter what happens, those enemy units that are next to your recon car are going to lose three attack power, which could be a, a lot. I mean, it is a lot, no matter what. But it also allows you to very quickly um, push units into a surrender state. Um, used as part of a power four strategy, it's it's very, very good way of quickly cleaning up enemies. I mean, <clears throat> if you have uh, Deadly Grasp and Fearsome Reputation on a unit, you can suppress an enemy by seven in a single turn. And that's pretty crazy. So it's a great trait. Especially if you're going to have a situation where your front line is pressed against their front line. Then if you have a, a Fearsome Reputation unit on your front line, you can constantly undermine their ability to attack. Uh, ferocious defense. Blah. Basically, it is the trait that prevents... Um, ignores entrenchment. It's only useful defensively. But, if you put it on an engineer along with no surrender, and you stick them in a city tile, then uh, that unit will be incredibly difficult to remove. Incredibly difficult to remove. So, you know, once again, in a defensive mission, it'd be pretty good. As the grand campaign rolls on, and we move into the phase where Germany starts losing the war, this hero might be more useful. But as it stands, it's not. It's not super useful. Okay, field repairs. And its partner, First Aid. I'm going to say that Field Repairs is an S-tier hero and that First Aid is a B-tier hero. Why the difference? Well, there used to be an exploit where you could use the Field Repairs hero to actually make prototypes out of nothing. And to make any, any unit that you had 10 of, you could manufacture more. But even with that ability removed, Field Repairs is incredibly potent in the Grand Campaign because you will get a lot of units where you get a sample. For example, you'll get like a sample of really good Italian anti-aircraft guns. You'll get a sample of 10 amazing anti-tank guns. And, and that's it. That's all you'll get for, for 20 missions or whatever. You'll just get those 10. And so as those units get ground down you will um, you'll lose access to them. But with field repairs, you will constantly repair 
those units, those special units will constantly be fixed. So you can use them forever without ever getting them wound down. And this can be pretty big. Because, I mean, for example, when you receive the KV-2, the KV that tank is easily two years advanced over the rest of your tanks and is way better than anything you've got for absolutely ages. Field repairs will carry that tank through the entirety of, I think it's 1941, without you ever having to bench it because you ran out of copies. Field repairs combines really nicely with double attack because it means that when you attack, if you don't use your secondary attack, it will you will get a free repair every turn. So you can be on the offensive and also be constantly repairing. It also saves you money. Uh, if you've always got it on your state-of-the-art units, those units are usually very expensive. So it's also saving you money and the repairs are made without any loss of experience. First aid is the same thing, but there the reason why it's down in B tier is because there are no exciting infantry units, really. So it keeps your engineers topped up. It's great with limited stock campaigns, but it's not like field repairs where you're going to get some amazing gifted prototype units that you really want to conserve. Field repairs allows you to keep, you know, units that are potentially twice as good as the stuff that you currently are able to deploy normally. It allows you to keep them on the front line without ever having to worry about them taking damage. Because, you know, you put your KV-2 on the front line and it takes one point of damage, well, within three missions or four missions, your KV-2 is now so damaged that it's not useful anymore and you've got no replacements. This is when you first get one. With field repairs, it's always going, you, you know, you're always going to find a moment to not attack and top up its health or you're going to have a couple of turns left at the end of the mission or you're going to have a couple of turns at the start of the mission. Field repairs always triggers as long as you have your attack left over and not your movement. So even if you're just maneuvering around, you're also repairing at the same time. It's a great hero. If you could if you could still manufacture units out of nothing with it, it would be like SSS tier. But uh, unfortunately, it's uh, it's not. So sad times. Okay. Fierce fighter. It's plus one attack for each adjacent enemy. It's not a good hero. Like D tier. If you're surrounded by the enemy, you're, you're doing something wrong. And plus one is not huge. I mean, the most you're ever going to get is plus two or plus three. It's okay, but not great. Doesn't work on aircraft either, so... If you were thinking, oh, I could stick it on a plane and stick that plane in the middle of an a, a horde of enemies and get a huge bonus, uh, it doesn't work like that. So, sorry. Fighter support we've done. Flag killer, plus five when attacking cities. It's all right. Once again, it's one of these plus attack bonuses that's useful on a dive bomber. Because it does work on dive bombers. <clears throat> but you're obviously, you're limited in targets to cities. And generally speaking, cities have got infantry in. And dive bombers are not very good against infantry. So, difficult to use effectively. Could also be useful on your own engineers for clearing cities. Um, you probably get some more utility out of it there, but... I would consider it to probably be directly inferior to Butcher or Tank Killer, even though it works on... See, the thing is, it works against hard and soft, but you never find hard units in cities. Ever. So, really, it's just directly inferior to Butcher. Just like a restricted version of Butcher. 
Force March we've discussed, Glider we've discussed, some of these have been duplicated because I think they've been duplicated because they are unit traits and also hero traits at the same time, but we won't discuss them twice. Half track support is um It's a trait on Wagner's half track. That basically it's the same as artillery support. But his half track is complete garbage, so <laughs> it can sit down here in F. Um, I mean, I mean, his half track is okay, but uh, still, go not not great. <laughs> there, you can you can keep his half track behind your front line, and it will attack enemy infantry and do a couple of points of damage. For those missions where Wagner's half track is around, hit and run. The inferior version of No Retaliation. It's No Retaliation, but only if your initiative is higher than theirs. A very mediocre hero. It combines... I guess it combines nicely with... Heroes that improve initiative. To sort of give you No Retaliation. But basically it's directly inferior to No Retaliation. Ignore a mass attack, I've never seen it. And it wouldn't make any sense anyway. If you're letting the enemy mass attack you, you're doing something really wrong. Uh, ignore his entrenchment we've already discussed. Fantastic hero. It's also a unit trait, I think that's why it's been duplicated. I think the reason why some of these have been duplicated is because they're hero traits and they're also unit traits. Ignores the zone of control we have discussed. Consolidator we have discussed. Interrogator is an unused trait in the game, so there's nothing to talk about there. Kamigazi we've discussed. Uh, last stand. I believe this is ignores all penalties from suppression. I don't think you can get it. But if you can get it, or if a mod unlocks it, it's not a bad defensive trait. I would rate it C for defensive defensive traits. Because if you're defending, and you've got in engineers in a city defending, last stand and no surrender together will prevent your, your uh, engineers from being suppressed and then pushed out. So... And no, no retreat, I suppose, if you put those three together. Preventing suppression is not... Preventing suppression from affecting you is not a bad trait to have on a defensive unit. But most of the game you want to be on the attack. Leadership. Ugh. E. <laughs> Plus one initiative to all adjacent units. It's hard to use. And one point of initiative is really not that much. It might change the outcome of a single point of damage. Maybe. The real use for this is to put it on a scout plane and farm experience points with it. It can make a little bit of difference in fighter versus fighter battles as well, because initiative values are actually pretty tight. If you look at fighters... Um, they've got like 10 initiative for the very, very best ones, and then most of them have got 8 or 9. A single point of initiative can sort of change who shoots first a little bit. You also gain, uh, I think it's either one or two points of initiative for being the attacker. So between being being the attacker and, and leadership, you might get the first hit in. But because of the way it alternates, it's really never going to be like the hugest deal. Learns from mistakes. Ugh. Ugh. I'm tempted to just stick it down here with all the uh, stuff that's not even in the game. It's that bad. E it is. It's, it, you know, 
It's experience that costs you money. It's really bad. It's a terrible hero. Sell it for prestige. <laughs> Legendary um, prestige generator. Better than uh, famous. So in D instead of E, but still it's just money. If you're having cash flow problems, it's a blessing. But most of the time, it's a curse. Lethal Attack. This fantastic hero. S or A. Hmm. Highly coveted hero. I'd say A. Uh, lethal Attack changes the threshold of damage from 20% kills and 80% suppression to 70% kills and 30% suppression for artillery and strat bombers. It is extremely potent on artillery and strat bombers and it also works on anti-aircraft guns that do suppression such as the 88 flak. So though this this hero just really turns um, turns any um, suppressive unit into more or less a normal unit in terms of, of damage output. If you can get overrun on an artillery with lethal attack, you can just finger of death. <laughs> you can just finger of death enemies, which is very very nice. Sorry, my my nose will not stop itching. My my surgery is playing up. I had my nose operated on as a kid and it itches from time to time. It's driving me mad right now. <laughs> okay, let's carry on. Liberator, double prestige for flag captures. It's, you know, money and very situational. The um, famous and um, legendary will just generate more prestige than that. Most of the time. Still, you can stick it on a recon car and make money with it, but I really don't rate economic heroes, so. Lightning attack prevents enemy support units from firing when you attack. This is a very good hero offensively. Um, probably at the same level as no retaliation, but it fills a slightly different role. It means that if, a, if enemy units are supported by an anti-tank gun, for example, you can just attack those units and the anti-tank gun won't shoot. It is the completely superior version of Distraction, which uh, I did not rate very highly at all. Where did I drop Distraction? Probably around C or... yeah. So, pretty good. But it's not useful in the air because generally speaking you want to go after enemies fighters first anyway so that you can make the sky safe. Um, it's good for assassinating units protected by artillery or anti-tank guns. Generally speaking you want to go after people's artillery or anti-tank guns first but lightning attack could allow you to make a hole in relative safety from which you could go after the, uh, the soft and juicy support units be behind. Low altitude attack we've discussed, low profile we've discussed, rapid fire 1.5x we've discussed, this is probably the unit trait version of it, military engineer we've discussed, and minesweeper and minefield, and no attack after move, and this, and this, and this, and this, and this. No retaliation, I'm pretty sure that we've just We've had that one before as well, as well as no retreat, no surrender, no upgrade, no split, no supply, no zone of control. On the roll! This is a hero I got banned. <laughs> Should be up here. Should be SSSS tier. Plus one attack for each unit you kill until the end of battle. Let me tell you, it does not take many kills before your unit becomes 
a one-shot slaying machine of all things. Place it on a tank, feed kills to that tank, and watch as that tank deletes everything in front of it. <clears throat> you want to combine on the roll with Ignore's Entrenchment, so that you can go after entrenched units and um, no retaliation so you don't take any return fire. Those three together creates a monster that will just that will just kill everything eventually. Plus attack bonuses are really, really powerful. A never ending, ever escalating one is insane. Like, take it on a fighter, for example. So you kill an enemy fighter, you gain plus one. Maybe you kill another enemy fighter or a bomber, you now you're at plus two. At plus two your fighter is now at the level of soft and hard attacks where they could realistically get a couple of kills on ground units. You get a few more kills after that, suddenly your fighter is doing two or three damage to all ground units. You get a few more kills after that, and it doesn't take long to escalate. Once you get to plus ten, you know, a fire plane is more lethal than a dive bomber against everything. And it's increasing, you know, it's increasing your air to air, your air to ground, and your uh, your air to soft, and your air to hard, and your anti shipping. So, if you were to put this on a fighter or a multi roll dive bomber, one that can hit air, air and ground, after just three or four kills, you you have a unit that is capable of very badly hurting everything. After about seven or eight kills, you've got a unit that can just delete, just finger of God style delete stuff. And the only reason why you wouldn't put it on a fighter or a, on a dive bomber is because it's even more ridiculous on a tank when you can combine it with um, uh, Overrun and um, Steamroller. You can just steamroll your way through as many enemies as you've got ammunition for. <laughs> On the roll was, in my first campaign, it was removed from the game for being too powerful. It is easily, easily the most powerful hero in the game. By far. It can turn any unit into a complete monster. It's as simple as that. <laughs> And you may think, you know, well, it doesn't do anything for your first couple of kills. Yeah, but you'll... It changes the way you play. It changes the way you think. You will deliberately weaken units so that your on-the-roll unit can get kills. And then once it gets going, uh, it, it will just annihilate everything. So, ridiculous hero. Glad it got taken out of the game. You might see it in mods or such. It still exists in the game, but it, it's not on the drop table anymore. Organized landing can attack immediately after landing. I've never seen this anywhere. But uh, it does exactly the same thing as um, rapid deployment. But just for, uh, for boats. So it's kind of inferior to rapid deployment. Which I think is... Rapid Deployment is like an A grade. Yeah, Fast Deployment is definitely an A grade hero. For naval landings are pretty rare. If you, It would be alright for, uh, for a naval mission, but they're pretty rare. And obviously, it's not useful all the time. Like, uh, like Rapid Deployment is. Fast Deployment, I should say. Overrun, we've discussed. Very much an S tier hero. We've discussed this, and this, and this. Precision weapon, yep, we've discussed this. Provocator! Uh, okay. There is an exploit with Pro Provocator that makes it an S grade hero. Basically, the AI does not understand Provocator. So, what you do is you put a soft unit that's very vulnerable, 
like an artillery piece or an anti-tank gun next to a unit that's very tough like a tank and you have that tank have provocateur on and what will happen is that the AI will attack the artillery be provoked into attacking the tank instead the artillery will fire on them in support of the tank and then the tank will shoot at them now there is a mission in the campaign where this trick has been set up to catch you out but it works on the AI too um, and that's just a basic way of setting it up. There are more complicated, more lethal ways to set this up. What's interesting is, Provocateur is a victim of its own incredibly powerful success because if there are 20 units next to you and you set up a Provocateur trap with some anti-tank guns and some artillery, the AI will keep attacking your artillery. Those units will be completely killed and wiped out and eventually you'll run out of ammo <laughs> and then they'll carry on attacking the artillery but they'll be provoked into hitting the tank each time and your tank will probably take a fair amount of damage potentially um but yeah correctly abused with the correct provocator setup you can provoke the ai into suiciding units um, without you really taking any damage in return for it. So it's incredibly potent if you use it correctly. If you don't use it correctly, then it's useless. <laughs> so, you need to think about Provocateur, but if you use it correctly, um, especially defensively, uh, it's incredibly potent. It's like, the, uh, it's like the camouflage thing. The AI will just suicide itself on you. Uh, and you can rack up lots and lots and lots of free kills and lots and lots of free support points Because it's kind of difficult to get the AI to attack into support To earn support points for support medals But with provocateur you can because the AI doesn't understand it You can actually Persuade the AI to take an attack that it would never normally take and thus get lots of support Which uh because you have to... I've got to demonstrate this because this Provocateur is kind of complicated. If this tank were the Provocateur... Let's put it here. So if this tank was the Provocateur and this artillery was the exposed unit... Let's move these out of the way. If the enemy comes in and attacks the artillery from here or here, it will just hit the artillery because the tank is not in it's not next to the enemy unit. But if the enemy was to attack the artillery from this hex, then it would be provoked into attacking the tank instead. So in order for provocateur to work, you need a cr you need a tight corridor or a, a carefully zone of controlled area to set up the trap. But if you can set up the trap correctly, then uh, then you can start murdering the enemy like crazy. Because, for example, if you were to have So the AI, making attack against this artillery, the AI is just calculating that it can hit this artillery without any threat. So the AI rolls its tank in and it attacks this artillery. It gets provoked into attacking this tank. Now, because the battle is between the enemy tank and this tank, both this artillery and this anti-tank gun will support the provocateur, resulting in this tank being annihilated by probably being annihilated by the support fire before the battle with the tank even happens. Now the issue is, is that this setup only works if the enemy attacks from this tile. If it attacks from... If it attacks from this tile, this tile, or this tile, then Provocateur won't work. So in that case, you might want two copies of Provocateur if you're, if you're trying to do it in a wide space like this then you want two copies of Provocateur. Let's 
just put down another tank just to demonstrate. So in this case, this if this was a provocateur and this was a provocateur, then this tile and this tile would result in the provocateur trap correctly springing. But this tile would still be vulnerable. So really, you'd ideally want this tank to be here in a in a line formation then this this tile and this tile because the ai will be tricked because the ai just sees an exposed artillery and just goes for it so it doesn't matter that these tanks are exposed because the ai will not target them because they are much more dangerous targets than this artillery the ai will just be like ooh exposed artillery and it will just go straight for it which then sets off your provocateur trap so it's a little bit awkward to set off the provocateur trap correctly and it does require a little bit of planning and maybe you know the right terrain for it but if you set it up correctly especially on a road the AI will just be like you know if the AI has got like seven units here the AI will be like oh exposed artillery oh my unit got killed oh exposed artillery oh my unit got killed oh exposed artillery Oh, my unit got killed. And it will just repeat this process until every single one of its units is dead. Which is crazy. But it will do it. So, very, very potent hero. But requires very specific setup. Okay, Prudent. This is a most hated hero. A-grade defensive hero. The only defensive hero to get into the top two categories, apart from low profile. Uh, gives you a point of defense for each point of strength you've lost. Fantastic hero on infantry. Because it doesn't take many lost points of health before infantry becomes incredibly difficult to destroy. Uh, especially in a city tile. Also uh, useful on any other unit that you have overstrengthed. More overstrength is better. If you were to have like some kind of zero slots consolidator, um, prudent hero uh, infantry unit, uh, you could get twenty five. You could get twenty five strength engineers. <laughs> That by the time they're down to 15 strength, i.e. they're the same size as a normal engineer unit, they would have plus 10 defense, making them, basically rule of 10 wise, making them pretty much impossible to damage by most units. So, there is a potential for Prudent to make units nearly indestructible, especially when combined with something like Consolidator and Overstrength. Very nice. Only beaten by one other, one other hero which we've not seen yet. Also, people hate Prudent because uh, it's been used against them. Rapid Fire 2x we've discussed. Readiness means that your unit will always attack first. This is a great hero on any unit, really. You always shoot first, which means you always damage the enemy first, which means you take less damage. It's great on fighters. It's I think it's at its best on fighters because fighters cannot defend themselves or each other. So being able to shoot first as a fighter is the only way to defend a fighter, really. Uh, apart from to use the old flower trick. So it's a beautifully potent move on uh, potent hero on fighters. It's also very nice on infantry for many of the same reasons. <clears throat> As long as you're operating from close combat tiles at all times. But it's decent on anything. I mean, it always benefits you to attack first. Enemies with readiness need to be very carefully engaged. Either with artillery, dive bombers, or um, strat bombers. Something that will not trigger, will not trigger readiness to go off. Or, if the unit in question, you know, doesn't have good stats, you can use a high armor unit. I mean, that they attack first doesn't doesn't mean that they're going to get damage done. If, the, you know, the unit in question is infantry in the open against a very heavily armored tank. But, uh, generally speaking, this is a great hero. 
especially on fighters. <clears throat> I mean, honestly, a really good fighter with readiness is basically indestructible. Um, what can the AI do about it? Nothing. They just got to suicide units into it until it runs out of ammunition, which they'll never do. Okay, recon we have discussed. Recon we have discussed. Reduced slots, of course. This is the inferior version of zero slots, but still very good. An easy A grade hero. Probably drops down to B grade if you're only allowed one hero. But still a nice to have. Combines well with Consolidator, of course. Right, Resilient is weirdly, weirdly good on conscripts and uh, engineer, uh, boat engineers. On throwaway units that are of big size. If you put Resilient on a 20 stack of boat engineers, it means that the enemy has to waste four attacks to get rid of them. Which is, you know, a nightmare. So it's very good defensively for chaff units that have big stack sizes. Uh, on conscripts as well, it's extremely good for the same reason. And remember that you, you can restore half your stack size per turn. So if the enemy's got two units attacking conscripts that are 20 stack, the most damage they can do is 5. So they do 10 damage, and then you just go ahead and repair for 10. <clears throat> they will never be able to break your conscripts. Ever. Ever. So Resilient is actually very good. Also very nice combined with... Um, one that we just discussed... Uh, that increases your defense by one. Prudent. Combines very nicely with Prudent to make sure that your unit doesn't die too quickly and that Prudent kicks in. Defensively, these two together are really nice. River Assault, we've discussed. Same as Amphibious. Awful. Awful ability. Only 50% damage when caught in an ambush. <laughs> to be honest, I'm tempted to just stick it down here with the stuff that's not even in the game. It's that bad. Scavenger. Uh, it's okay. I mean, it's, a, it's an economic hero. You get twice as many units when you um, capture equipment. Great way to make money, great way to make parts, but doesn't increase the combat capability of your unit in any way. It's just another way to make money and gear. Generally speaking, as long as you understand the capturing system, you shouldn't have issues with money and gear. So, Scavenger kind of falls down a little bit. And it, you know, it applies to just one unit, so you have to you have to keep your scavenger unit ready to get the hit in, the, the capturing hit in. So it's a pain in the ass to actually utilize it. Uh, you know, a lot of the time, what you can capture on a mission is restricted by the amount of turns you've got left. So having to faff around capturing with just your scavenger hero. You you might you might not have enough time to actually get everything, so. But anyway, I mean it's not it's not terrible. Shock tactics we've discussed. Single entity we've discussed. Single shot we've discussed. Sixth sense. Garbage. E. <laughs> Immune to ambushes. If you're scouting with your recon cars and your recon planes, you shouldn't get ambushed. I suppose you could stick it on a tank if you're willing to hurl your tank into the void. Uh, I mean, if you don't know if the, if the if an area is full of the enemy, the last thing you want to do is hurl one of your units into the into the void 
Sixth Sense or not. So, just no. <laughs> skill Recon we discussed. Skill Support. This is the 10% version of Expert Support. It stacks with the other support ones. So, Expert Support is in A, Skilled Support is in B, but they all stack. So Skilled Support stacks with Expert Support, which stacks with Double Support. But remember, the final unlock for Artillery is Double Support. So these two, stacked together, uh, can still offer something to Double Support Artillery. Double Support is trapped down here because you will get that eventually on all of your units. So you might as well get it via the actual unit leveling system than have it as a hero. Whereas skilled support and uh, an expert support, of course, while those are the first two tiers, you will eventually lose access to them. So then having them as heroes and stacking them with a double support unit is, is useful. But I'm only thinking about the end game here, where your unit is maxed out. Obviously, early on in the campaign, you might get skilled support early and not have unlocked expert or double. So then double is actually very good. So just things to consider. But this is the only one that's actually useful once you've maxed out a unit. Although it does stack with this, but it's questionable as to whether you want to use up two hero slots by putting both of these on the same unit. Okay, uh, yeah, this is fast entrenchment all over again. Splitter. Steamroller, of course, is an amazing ability, but only works with overrun now. Unlocked by doing 25 overruns, or I think 10 in the main campaign, not the grand campaign. But it's not as good as it was because of... Now you have to use the overrun hero to unlock this on units other than tanks. But still incredibly potent ability. The best part about it is not just that you get your move back and your attack back. But as long as you kill the enemy, any damage that they would have done is mitigated. So you can steamroll your way through the enemy and not take any damage in return. Which is glorious. Steamroller and on the roll together are... Two are too terrifying for Panzer Corps two. They had to go. Okay, first strike is a weird one. It's directly superior to readiness because it um, it gives you readiness. You you attack first. That's exactly what readiness does. So it's superior to readiness. I guess you could consider it to be S-Class. The only thing about it is, offensively, you attack first as well. But you do not... Um, it's not like No Retaliation where you attack first and the enemy doesn't shoot back. You attack first and if there's any enemies left, they do hit back. So it's kind of weird in that, basically... It's exactly the same as readiness. I, find, I wouldn't really rate it S. It's kind of A too. Basically, readiness is the is the great thing. This is also readiness. So you can just think of it as another copy of readiness. But it does have the ability to allow you to shoot first as if you had maximum initiative. As if you had like 100 initiative. But it does not stop the enemy from shooting back like no retaliation does. So, the offensive part of First Strike is like a C-tier ability. But the fact that it also has readiness makes it A-tier. I wouldn't say that it's worthy of S-tier because the extra ability is not that great compared to readiness. So, you could more or less just think of this as another copy of readiness. Great on a fighter, of course. Because fighters have got a good chance of actually completely killing the enemy. In which case it will act like no retaliation, 
and then you've got your readiness to make sure that your fighter can defend itself. I wouldn't say it's a game changer, but yeah, if I if I had like A and A star, this is like A and this is like A star ability. Okay, superior maneuver, one initiative for each point of, I think it's attack over the enemy. This is just a horribly inferior version of nerve retaliation slash hit and run, etc. You know, initiative's pretty, initiative changing stuff's pretty poor. I'll probably stick that down in E. Suppressing fire we've discussed. Survivor is an unlockable trait where if your unit gets hammered and it would have died, it instead survives with 1 HP. It's not bad. It can help you survive a terrible mistake that you have made. Um, but, you know, typically speaking, you don't want to be making those kind of mistakes. You, you will unlock it naturally over time. So, And it's difficult to unlock. Because it means being hit four times in a single turn. So it's quite difficult to unlock, but it's a nice to have. But it doesn't really, 99% of the time, it shouldn't really do anything for you. Okay, tank killer. Easily the best of the plus attack um, heroes. Other than on the roll, which is banned. Plus five attack against tanks. Adds... A great deal of lethality to infantry, to tanks, to dive bombers. Um, really allows you to kill hard targets much more efficiently. Um, to give you an example, okay. So if you take the regular infantry, well, let's take engineers. It's more realistic. Engineers have got 12 hard attack. Now, your average late war tank has got 4 close defense, or 6. Something like that. 4 or 6. Let's take 4 as the example. Yeah, 4, four is the general one. Okay, so... 4 close defense. Four close defense against 12 hard attack leaves you with eight. That means that eight of eight, 80 percent, I suppose, of your attacks are potentially going to be lethal. Um, around that, around 80 percent of your attacks are potentially going to be lethal, and the other 20 percent are going to be suppressive, potentially, because you have eight over four, following the rule of ten. Now, with plus 5 hard, you have gone from 80% lethality to complete lethality. Like, almost guaranteed that every attack is going to be lethal. <clears throat> so you've gone from potentially doing, I would say, 8 or 9 kills to 12. 12 to 15, easily. It's not as simple as that, but it's pretty huge. Um, and likewise, uh, and that would be true of the units with six close defense as well. And likewise, dive bombers have got the same kind of value, hard attack 10, hard attack 12, against the air defense of a tank. Some of these have got, you know, air defense 14, air defense 12. Even as much as 16 or 17 air defense in the case of the mouse. Let's take 14 as the average. So, you go from dive bombers where you, you only have two hard attack advantage, or even no hard attack advantage, to suddenly having five. Five advantage, which is 50% more damage. Which is, you know... Going from one or two kills to going to, you know, six or seven kills. So stat boosters are amazingly potent when the values are close together. 
the, the your attack values and their defense values are close together. It's like a 50% bonus. Hugely potent. Combines beautifully with anything here. Combines beautifully with Rapid Fire 2X, Consolidator, um, or any of the offensive things. Rapid Fire. Just makes, makes pretty much any unit more deadly. A lot of people make the mistake of using it on things like the 21 centimeter gun, things or anti-tank guns, things that already have great big anti-tank values. It's not useful there. You're probably already 10 above the enemy's defense anyway, in which case it's not going to do anything. It is most powerful when the values are close together, not far apart. So most people use this incorrectly, but used correctly, uh, on units that really benefit from it, it changes their potency dramatically. Tenacious Defender. Uh, it's like an E-grade defense ability. You maybe get a couple of extra points of defense out of it. Better than nothing, but not far above nothing. Thorough Preparation. I've just gotten this garbage hero in my campaign. Gives you an initiative bonus that goes away over time. Inferior to pretty much everything. Everything that, you know, adjusts who attacks first. Inferior to first strike, inferior to no retaliation, inferior to hit and run, inferior to leadership, frankly. Really bad. <laughs> Good candidate for being converted into prestige. Unyielding is... Uh, we've already discussed the other version of this. Last Stand. Um, unit cannot be suppressed. Or it ignores all penalties from suppression. Same thing. Um, useful on engineers or other units that are defending for you. If you're in a defensive engagement. Very useful because it prevents enemy artillery from suppressing your unit and stopping it from fighting or forcing it to retreat. Unyielding combines nicely with um, the uh, high grade defensive um, capabilities like resilient and um, Ah, uh, resilient and uh, prudent. Meaning that there's really no way to easily unstick your defender. Once again, these, these heroes might become more useful and more, more important uh, if you're playing the historical route of the war and you're now on the defensive a lot. Then, uh, you know, more ways to prevent your infantry from being removed from cities is, is always useful, always helpful. Okay, Vigilant. The only S-tier defensive hero in the game. Vigilant prevents the enemy from accessing your close defense rating. For tanks, that is absolutely massive and changes completely the way you play. Because, normally, you wouldn't hang around in cities as a tank. Because you're concerned about your close, your close combat value being accessed. But, with Vigilant, you don't have to worry about it. So in a city, you enjoy, and so for example, in this city, we enjoy four, four base entrenchment. With Vigilant... You can always be in the city. You're not worried about infantry coming after you. So, four, four entrenchment is 40% less damage from other units, from other tanks or anti-tanks. So what that means is, with, vig with Vigilant on, you can move from city to city to city... And you're safe in the knowledge that if an enemy tank attacks you, you are enjoying 
you're enjoying that four that four base entrenchment from being in that city and they their enemy tanks are forced to use the open tiles which do not offer any good base entrenchment at all and then of course infantry have gone from being able to murder your vehicle in close combat to doing absolutely nothing <clears throat> so with vigilant you can put tanks into cities to defend them and there's really very little the enemy can do about it i think as of all the defensive heroes as the war changes for germany and you start playing defensive missions a vigilant tank in a city is going to be the optimal defense because no one is going to be able to break it like nobody so it's a very 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 powerful very very powerful defensive hero that will change the way that you play with tanks entirely <clears throat> where you used to be always thinking about avoiding the close combat tiles avoiding the hill tiles avoiding the uh, swamp tiles you're always having to think about which open tiles you want it to be on noting that open tiles very rarely offer any good defense value at all now you can take all the juiciest most defensive tiles you can be in the forest you can be on the mountain you can well on the hill you can be in the city you can gain those defensive bonuses for hard versus hard with no risk that enemy infantry is going to just walk in and butcher you so it's a it's the only S tier defensive hero in the game in my opinion because it totally changes your approach to tank deployment tank usage tanks in city tiles are unbelievably difficult to destroy dive bombers are really the only way to get rid of them well normally you would get rid of them by just using infantry and that is exactly what Vigilance prevents. In some ways, um, Readiness and First Strike also allow you to put tanks in city tiles because you shoot first, so you kill most of the infantry before it hits you. <clears throat> but you always have to worry about the fact that the infantry stack size is big. So even if your tank is incredibly lethal and you shoot first and you do 10, you, the most damage you can do with a 10 stack of tanks is 10. So then you've got five enemy infantry hitting you back and they probably will kill a great number of your tanks because in close combat you're defenseless. <clears throat> but Vigilant prevents, prevents all that. So it's a fantastic hero which I never seem to be able to get a copy of, unfortunately for me. Okay, vulnerable target. This is a provocateur. Uh, not used in the game and zero slots not surprising to anybody that this would be up here <clears throat> because it allows you to get a free unit that is 15 over strength combined with consolidator to get a free unit that's 20 over strength and suddenly you have a very 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 scary unit uh, not much more to add to that really zero slots is uh is it's not as good in single hero so there's there's one thing about it which is strictly speaking you can you you can overstrength a hero to 15 you just have to pay for it in slots <clears throat> so in theory it doesn't increase the power of a unit because you know, for example, in an ideal world, you'd want maybe Consolidator and you take a unit to 20 strength and then add like Rapid Fire, maybe Tank Killer or, or some other thing. And that unit would be more powerful than having to waste a slot, waste a hero slot on zero slots. When you've only got one hero per unit, then zero slots kind of prevents you from having a hero. You get a free unit, 
that's 15 strength. So that's still really great. <clears throat> but you can't add any special effects to that unit. It, it effectively, it takes up a space. <clears throat> that if you've got the slots to pay for it, then uh, it's not a big deal. It's, but... A lot of people don't know this, but some missions, or a number of missions, are limited in the amount of units that you can deploy. So if you start getting a lot of zero slots heroes, you might not be able to use them all. You might actually hit the deployment limit. For example, if you've only got one airfield, then the most planes that you can deploy is seven. That's it. So, you know, if you've got 20 zero slots heroes, you might not actually be able to deploy all of those extra units. But this is nitpicking, really. This is a, this is a great hero. Okay. That is my complete list. We have done them all. So, I hope you guys enjoyed this. My voice will never be the same again. But people have been asking for this for a long time. These are my thoughts. Most of the S tier stuff is based around exploits that make them incredibly powerful. Make these abilities very, very powerful. Um... Some of these are no longer in the game. Rapid Fire 2X is quite hard to find as a hero now. On the Roll was removed from the drop list. These are close combat abilities, of course. Certain abilities are just very good. Um, yup. That is it. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, this... I'll put the link for this somewhere so you can play around with it if you want. Um, special thanks again to Tazadar for providing me with all the pictures for this. And uh, yeah, I'd love to hear your thoughts down in the comments. That is it. I'll see you guys next time.